how much is enough? Is anything ever enough? It sounds like a philosophical question, but it's also one about economics. So here's one way to approach answering it. A father and son write a book. The father is a famous economic historian. The son is a lecturer in philosophy. I welcome Robert and Edward Skidelsky, authors of the book, How Much is Enough? Um, what, what I'm struck by, Robert, in this book is it, it, it's familiar. For in, the, in the 19th century, there used to be many conservatives who would argue against industrialization because the feeling was this is just turning into kind of materialism and everybody wants more, more, more. And then your great man, Keynes, wrote a, wrote a piece in the 30s saying, yeah. we're producing so much wealth that at some point everyone will have enough stuff and they can all work for a few hours a day and, you know, uh, uh, in, enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, Marx used to argue that uh, as well in his own way. But it hasn't quite worked out that way. For whatever reason, as a predictor of how human beings will behave, we do seem to want more and more and more and more. We do. I think Keynes was heir to that moral Victorian tradition um, in which money was regarded as a means to something, a good life. And he was um, the last, really, of economists, or last generation of economists who thought in these terms and thought of economics as a moral science and that you needed to ask always the question, enough for what? What is money for? Um, otherwise, you are adrift. You just go on accumulating uh, without end, uh, without purpose. Uh, so he said, enough for a good life. And he thought that technology was bringing that about, that it was actually uh, producing such increases in wealth um, that we would be able to have abundance with a fraction of the work we, the people were then doing. Uh, but that, that, that bit of it hasn't come about. Why? I think there are you know, a number of explanations. One is that our society has become much more unequal than it was when Keynes was writing. And the other is I think he underestimated the uh, uh, force of insatiability. Um, the, the, the relative character of wants. That you, you, you end up with new needs and new wants, and if, if, if you have one car, you feel like, well, maybe it'd be even more fun to have three. In the book, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, briefly what you're saying is you need enough for a kind of good, what we would consider middle class or upper middle class life in terms of material comforts, house, things like that, and that beyond that, the kind of constant accumulation of more stuff doesn't give you a good life. What gives you a good life is time spent with your family, building relationships, pursuing activities that you find interesting. Yeah. Well, we, we break it down into seven basic goods, as we call them. So these are the goods that uh, together make up a good life. Health, respect, security, personality, harmony with nature, friendship, and leisure. So once you have enough money to enjoy these goods, and once society has enough money to enjoy these goods collectively, then you have a good life. And, and it's insane to go on and on and on. And it, there's a trade-off, because in order to get more and more money, you have to sacrifice. Uh, you don't have the time for those friendships. You don't have the time yeah. for leisure. You don't have you know, the, the ability to pursue that good life. In economic terms, they all have opportunity costs. Leisure has an opportunity cost because it means when you're enjoying leisure, you're, uh, you're, you're foregoing the extra income that you could be getting when uh, you're working. And so if you're rational, you balance these things. But of course, that's also an insane way of doing, doing it. When you're poor, of course, you need to work in order to get enough. Um, when you're already rich, do this kind of calculation and, and um, say, well, if I go to the theater, uh, I'll, I'll um, not make an extra hundred dollars that I would get by, by staying at my desk. I mean, when you're already rich, that, mean, that, that seems to me an insane calculation. But how do you determine the problem, I'd say, in America is nobody thinks they're rich. They're all trying to get richer. Maybe that's because they think they're not as rich as other people. And also... Is I, there an objective standard you could... Well, I, I think the other thing that Americans worry about, and indeed many Europeans, is there's be, been a big increase in insecurity. They may have wealth, but how long will it last? What about their retirement? What about the cuts in services? What about their jobs? They may lose them. So there's this insecurity, and one of our basic goods is security. We believe there was more security, actually, in the 50s and 60s, certainly in terms of jobs, than there is today. 
The one thing that does seem to be clear is that the research on happiness, if one can describe uh, this as, as uh, serious research, but there, there are lots of studies that say that what makes people happy once they have achieved some kind of middle class status is human relationships, ties to their families, uh, leisure pursuits, you know, civic activities. It, it's not the third car. Yeah, and, but these are the very things that don't get into gross domestic product statistics, which are entirely about uh, the goods that enter the market and their exchange in the market. All those other things that give people uh, a feeling that they're leading a good life and that con contents them, a lot, they're sort of ignored. And so the, the a pursuit of growth as such is a highly misleading objective because it just concentrates on a narrow segment of goods um, and um, you always really want to ask what is growth for what what growth of what growth of what and if you say growth of pollution um, that is obviously rubbish that that's not something you ought to be thinking about but growth of friendship how do you how do you get it into GDP the king of Bhutan of course he's uh, he um, he suggests uh, substituting gross domestic happiness as the goal of his people um, well I can see why in a way because if there's if there are lots of people are very very poor and you can persuade them that they're happy um, then he can keep uh, his palaces going and people won't get discontented about it so it's a bit of a it's a it's a bit of a, um, uh, a poison chalice that that notion of happiness because also unless you're very careful you, you get into a brave new world situation where rulers make people happy by giving them a psychic aspirin or something like that and then they feel idiotically happy the whole time Skidelsky, Pear and Feast, thank you very much for joining us.